Buonasera. Um, thanks, first of all, first, Mark, for the invite. Thanks, Parsons, for hosting us today. Um, for me, tonight is going to be probably one of the most difficult speeches in many, many years. Because 20% of my presentation are what I say to you. 20% are the images and the slides and the videos that you see behind me. But then 60% is my hands. I move a lot, I walk. So today, usually I have a headset. So today I have to choose between just staying here in this cage in front of a mic or using this. So I don't know if I will succeed in using this. Anyway, I will try. Um, I already lost 30 seconds. I have 19 minutes and 30 seconds more to convince you uh, of the reasons why design today is needed more than ever in the business world, in corporations like PepsiCo, or in uh, small startups, in a variety of different uh, contexts and situations. Um, now, one of the key reasons is that the world is radically changing today. Can we turn down a little bit the lights so that we can see the slides? The world is changing. It's radically changing with an acceleration uh, never experienced before. There are a variety of different drivers of this change, and the most of them are actually anchored into the digital world and the technology uh, that is radically uh, modifying the scenario we live in. Uh, technology, internet, global markets, social media, uh, that essentially is changing the way we connect, we share, we interact with each other. It is creating uh, people, consumers that are smarter, are savvy, are demanding, are often very spoiled. Uh, this, that is creating competition without any boundary of geography and time. We don't compete anymore just with other products and brands on shelf, but we compete with a variety of different products and brands that eventually are not in the same context of purchase. They are not on shelf with us. Uh, there is uh, a new uh, social scenario and business scenario where to have an idea and transform that idea in a viable commercial product is becoming easier and easier. There are not the barrier to the entrance that we used to have in the past. Uh, to get access to global communication is relatively easy. You don't have anymore the barrier to the entrance given by uh, TV uh, and more traditional kind of advertising. It's becoming more and more easy to get access to low-cost manufacturing. Uh, to get access to funding is becoming uh, because of this hyper-connected society, much easier again. Uh, sites like kickstarter.com, for instance, are changing completely the way you can share ideas and then getting support, financial support, to take them to market. And finally, social media essentially are creating uh, a completely different scenario where the brands are not the actors of the communication anymore. Actually, they are becoming the topic of communication. And it's all about being part of the conversation going on online. And then there is something that is about to come. It's something that we call Internet of Things. Essentially, everything that surrounds us, our clothes, the car that we drive, the house we live in, our offices, and the objects that are inside these contexts are becoming more and more smart. And absolutely connected with each other. So this is going to impact radically the way we interact with products, brands, and the way corporations and businesses are building their brands. This is creating a scenario where people don't buy products anymore. What they search is solutions that are as holistic as possible, experiences that are meaningful and relevant for them, and finally, they want to be part of a broader story or a bigger story that needs to be absolutely authentic to them. Consumers are consuming content with the speed of light. And with content, we mean a product. It could be this new pair of shoes. It could be a new song. It could be a new piece of communication and entertainment. We are totally bombarded by new contacts in a variety of contents, in a variety of different forms and shapes. And we consume them at the speed of light. And this is really changing, once again, the way corporations need to interact with their consumers and users. As I said earlier, brands are not the actors of a communication anymore. In the past, we were having a top-down, one-direction communication, TV-centric. Today, we as brands are part of the conversation. We are the topic of the conversation, and we do, don't control the conversation anymore. And therefore, while in the past, corporations with the right assets and resources could eventually buy 
that conversation, access to that conversation, and a presence in your life and in your mind. Today is a completely different kind of scenario where you need to gain the right to be part of the conversation. And so there are two macro challenges. One is that you need to be relevant, as relevant as possible. And this is not easy at all because things are moving so fast that to be relevant, you really need to be on top of the latest trends, the latest behavior of people in general in the society, then in relation to your categories of products and to your brands. So you need to redesign the organization and the way of working and thinking of this corporation to really be on top of what's going on out there. And you can imagine with the scale of this gigantic organization, how difficult it is to move in a very nimble way to be on top of everything that's going on out there. The second challenge is the frequency. We say that consumer consume content at the speed of light. Therefore, you, the cycle of innovation are getting accelerated more and more and more. We need to keep creating content constantly. And again, with content, I mean from product, so product innovation, all the way to the way we communicate about those products, the way we activate those products, the experiences you have with those products, digital experiences as well as offline uh, physical experiences in a variety of different contexts. Uh, think about the automotive industry. To design a car and commercialize a car, uh, 20 years ago, the cycle of innovation was about 10 years. Today, you have three years of cycle, and actually, every year almost, you have you know, major, major restyling with, with innovation embedded in that kind of restyling. That's just one example. In our industry, in food and beverage, things are moving even faster and faster, especially with the proliferation of startups, new entrants, new competitors, that eventually, you know, sometimes they create a problem market share, but the, most of the time, the real challenge is they gain mind share of, of people, of consumers. And so it's a society that is moving at the speed of light. So what we need to do, as I said earlier, is to design not just products or packaging or pieces of communication or advertising. We need to design experiences that are holistic. So what is an experience? This is how we decodify an experience in PepsiCo, is people interacting with a solution, could be a product, a service, or, or, or a brand, in a context that most of the time we hear, you know, the context of purchase and the context of use in time. So by definition, an experience is a story. We, we heard a lot, we hear a lot this word storytelling. Well, the experience is a story by definition. And we can decodify it even more uh, with what I like to call a practical journey. This is uh, the practical journey of the experience you have with products and brands. It's the idea of buying something, then you purchase it, you receive it, you unpack it, you use it, you store it, you dismiss it. If you think about an architecture, a space, or retail, it's the idea of entering in a space, you see the space, then it's the moment you actually step in, then you interact in the space in time, you live, so you spend time in that space, and finally you live from the space. So again, as designers, we don't design just the product. We don't design just the space. We don't design just packaging or a piece of digital uh, content. We want to design the entire experience. And even if you are a junior designer, and eventually, you know, in the phase of your journey, your career, you are focused on a specific aspect of that experience, you always need to think bigger and broader and think about the overall experience that people are going to have with your brands so that you can understand how you're going to be a piece of the macro puzzle that is the overall experience that consumers search with your brands and with your products. And this is extremely important then if you become the chief design officer of a company or a brand leader or if you come up with your startup and your new business, thinking broadly about the experience. Now, this is the journey, but we say that we need to be relevant, right? We need to be meaningful. We need to add meaning to that experience. So how do, what, how do you design the meaning of those experiences? What, do you, what does it mean to design meaningful experiences? Well, every time you interact with a brand, it could be a luxury fashion brand, it could be a, a, a raising Italian a street style shoes brand, it could be a, a famous automotive a brand, it could be a mass market iconic brand like Pepsi. There are two levels of interaction that you have with those brands and with those products. The first one is you in relation with the brand or the product 
is the pleasure or the reassurance or that emotion that you have when you buy that product. Is, you know, I often make the example uh, for the women in the, in the audience today. Imagine when you buy, for instance, a pair of Prada shoes and the brand is not out there. It's just you, you, you just love the brand, you love those shoes and it's your intimate pleasure of owning them. Now, for everybody else, think about something that you really, really love. And that moment when you buy it, you purchase it, is, is beyond rationality, is in your guts. That's one level of relation and communication. The second one is what the product or the brand tell the world about you. Everything that surrounds us, the shoes I'm wearing today, the watch without hands that I'm wearing today, the car I drive, the office I have, the, the design of my house, uh, my haircut, a tattoo, anything is telling a story about me to others. And it's a story that sometimes people curate, are direct, in a very conscious way, that most of the time they don't, but we as designers, this is what we do. We curate the story that people are telling through the products and the brands that surround them. So when we say we design meaning, that's what we talk about. Meaning means the personal interaction that is between you and the product or brand that you buy, and then the story that the product and brand is telling about you to the rest of the world. It could be, again, a brand or a product category. To, to, to walk on the street with a can of Pepsi or with a can of our competitor, you're already telling a different story to the world. To walk with a can of cola or with a bottle of water, you're already telling a story. The brands that you choose, obviously in fashion for instance, you are telling a story. It's always a story. And we designer, a storyteller, and designer of meaning, we are in charge of designing that conversation between you and the product and what the products say about you to others. Now, if this is true, what are the steps that we follow to design these meaningful experiences? Well, this is what I call the emotional flow that overlap the practical journey that I was uh, sharing with you a second ago. So essentially, any product touch point of the ecosystem of a brand, so the product itself, advertising, the retail experience, service, packaging, digital experience, events, Anything is part of this journey. You need to design in a very seamless, consistent way the story across every touch point of the brand. So keep it in mind, because now you will see a series of totally random, that are not the random examples, that, that connect to this kind of uh, ecosystem. But anyway, what is this journey? There are three steps of interaction that are Essentially, my free interpretation of the theories of a human scientist, Donald Norman, apply to the world of business. So the first one is, so again, are the theory of a human scientist that's been studying the relation between people and people and people and space. So the first interaction is what I like to call the visceral relation. So imagine when you meet a beautiful woman or a beautiful man, or you're in front of a beautiful landscape, you're in front of the Grand Canyon or Maldives, the sea, and you're like, Wow, it's the butterfly in your stomach. It's beyond rationality. It's something on your skin and it transcends completely your, your brain. It's just something you have inside. That's what you want to have every time you design a product. It's something you are in front of a vintage collection of, of 7 Up or is a fashion collection that we designed, for instance, in, uh, in Shanghai for Fashion Week a few weeks ago together then with the can associated to, to the collection. It could be the entrance of the giant stadium in New York. Uh, it could be Pepsi Perfect. It could be many, you know, many, many other different kind of activation across every touch point. What we always try to achieve is the first wow moment. It's the first thing that you don't even think. You just like it. You just love it. Or eventually you hate it. It's okay. We need to polarize. It's really about polarizing. And then in the guts to take the risk to polarize. But th this could be another speech another time, but one of the major problems of many corporations is the inability to take risk and the confidence, the lack of confidence in taking that kind of risk. Now, every time you create something that is viscerally interacting with you, it's not just about the beautiful design. There is always a connection with the cultural context, with your background uh, that you need to create. So when we're talking about creating relevance for people, understanding what the way people think and, and behave and connect, that's extremely important. This is not just a beautiful or ugly, depending on your taste, bottle. This is a bottle that links back to, for instance, uh, a part of our pop culture, of worldwide pop culture. This is the celebration of the movie with Michael J. Fox, Back to the Future 2. And you may remember 
uh, Marty McFly going back to the future 21st of October of 2015 and entering this store and asking for a Pepsi free and the guy's like, we don't have Pepsi free. What is Pepsi free? We have Pepsi perfect. This one is special. Hey, 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 hey. All I want is a Pepsi. So the 20, that day was the 21st of October 2015. So last year, 21st of October of 15, we have been launching Pepsi Perfect. We, it's been an, an amazing, amazing success online. In, after a few hours from the launch, we found bottles online sold for $400, $500. The cost of the bottle was $20.15, celebrating 2015, the year he was going back to the future. This is a few months after what I found, still a nine, essentially $100 online. So this is very interesting you know, to talk about the first visceral relation between people and products and brands. The second step is what I like to call the interactive relation. So back to the analogy of Donald Norman, it's like when you go out with this woman or with this man and you just love to stay with them. It's rational and emotional. You are thinking about the experience you're having. You are um, sunbathing in Bahamas and your friends are back in the office in New York under the snow. Uh, it's really, you know, you, you think and you feel the specific moment. And this is, this happened also with products and brands. Uh, this is a machine that we designed, essentially is a fountain that gives you the possibility to customize your drink, starting from a base, could be water, could be a Pepsi, a Dew, or a tea, and then you add flavors, and you can create thousands of different flavors. The challenge was big here, because you wanted to have that emotional engagement of having fun with this machine, but you wanna also have very fast transactions. So the balance between rationality and emotionality needs to be always there. The balance between styling and functionality is something you always wanna consider in everything, in everything you do. Uh, this is a new product that we pre-launched in, in, in Brazil last year. Essentially, it's a sustainable drink, thinking about uh, especially millennial, and the fact that more and more we have access to drinkable water everywhere we are. So many people are now walking around, especially in college, in campuses, with their empty bottle that they fill with water, and, but still you have the need eventually to customize your, your water, to, to add flavors or vitamins or whatever um, you, may, you may imagine. Uh, so this is one, one product that is answering that kind of need. It's called Drinkfinity. Again, we launched it in, in Brazil last year. And this is the same kind of idea translated in the world of Gatorade for professional athletes. So total customization of your drink for you on the base of your physiology and the performance needs that you have. For instance, we have been experimenting with this product uh, with the national soccer team of Brazil during the Soccer World Cup. This is part, by the way, of a longer vision that we have for brands like Gatorade. This is a short video to share with you, to share with you that vision. The future. It's not an inheritance. It's an opportunity. For Gatorade, the opportunity is clear. Push the sports fuel ecosystem further to support the athlete of tomorrow. In the future, NFL players wear sweat patches, sending real-time fuel data and hydration tracking to team trainers through sideline carts. Access to technology goes well beyond the lab. Athletes instantly receive specific feedback, no matter where they work out. G-Camps dive deeper through on-field testing, measuring hydration, glycogen, and electrolyte levels. Wearable technology transmitting wirelessly allows trainers to analyze data and provide direct feedback. Knowing their specific sweat rate and type of sweat, athletes choose their formula using the Gatorade fuel pods and the intelligent hydration bottle. Before training, athletes receive alerts detailing the intensity, weather conditions, and duration of the upcoming practice. They're also provided with a strategy for fueling, before, during, and after workouts. During training, the hydration tracking system instantly tells athlete and trainer about fuel input and output. To replenish their supply, athletes get their Gatorade fuel pods from intelligent vending machines. Monthly supplies of Gatorade fuel can be ordered online or through premium retail doors. 
From awareness to tracking to delivery, every aspect of the sports fuel ecosystem will be connected. Every step in the process will be seamless. After 50 years of fueling athletes, the best is still yet to come. Gatorade, defining the future of sports fuel. So you see this approach applied to the present, but applied then also to the future. And again, always that balance between emotionality and rationality is something we find also on this project. This is called FIS. It's the idea of reigniting love for carbonated soft drinks. This is a Willy Wonka kind of installation where essentially you start with a base that could be Mountain Dew or Pepsi or a variety of different carbonated soft drinks and then you create a full experience starting from the product itself to the preparation, the rituality of that preparation all the way to the context of the experience and this quick vid. <laughs> We're here in Queens debuting Fizz to the World. Okay, so we're getting a great response today. This is not a drink, it's really an experience. Fizz is a whole new way to look at soda. We have these really cool machines called Pepsi Spire. These things are already flowing now. Head over to these guys called Fizzologists. These guys are taking the most unexpected flavors and creating the most imaginative drinks. We say there is this first moment that is the visceral interaction, the wow effect. Then you have this engagement, rational and emotional. The third step is what they call the expressive relation. So you are so happy of this relation that you have with this man or this woman. You want to talk about her or him to everybody. You are back from vacation. You share the pictures of your vacation you know, through your social media to, with all your friends and your family. It's about this pride and willingness to share your experience with others. And this is something we always keep in mind. Thinking about Spire, for instance, the fountains that I, I, we just shared with you a second ago. This is a mobile... Uh, kitchen with two spire machine and then a full working kitchen that we designed with Karim Rashin that is creating a, essentially experiences now all around the United States. Uh, we took it to Super Bowl, it will be at a variety of different locations from South by Southwest to Lollapalooza, Coachella and so on and so forth. Um, is what we did for the Soccer World Cup for instance where we took many of our athletes this is uh, Lionel Messi, and we had a famous uh, photographer, Danny Clinch, taking this portrait, black and white, of the, of, the, of the soccer players. And then we had street artists from the different countries of the different soccer players creating art on the photography during a live event in, in London. We took then that, that art, and we have been doing a series of partnerships with a series of fashion brands from Del Toro shoes, Penguin jackets, Bang & Olufsen for headphones, shot skateboard, and so on and so forth. Always thinking about creating that kind of conversation online. This is a collaboration we, we, we did with Franca Sozzani and Vogue Italy, where we took 10 young designers from all around the world to create a collection inspired by the equity of Pepsi, this idea of live for now, celebrating life, and celebrating the moment. And these are some of the pieces we presented in Dubai and then in Milan. Or this is a collaboration with Nike around uh, Uncle Drew, I don't know if you ever heard of Uncle Drew, if you didn't Google it, you will see what I'm talking about. But this is a limited edition um, uh, shoe that, by the way, we gave just to a series of trendsetters influencer. It was then found online a few, few weeks later uh, for $8,000, one shoe, another one was for $6,000. So again, all about creating that kind of conversation um, online. Or Cola House, you may have heard, some of you may have heard of Cola House, is an idea we've been experimenting with in Milan during Design Week last year. Uh, 
creating partnership with a series of influencers, opinion leaders, uh, and talents, from Lenny Kravitz to Marcelo Burlon, Nicola Formichetti, the art director of Diesel and Lady Gaga, and so on and so forth, creating an experience where it's all about the collision between the world of music, sport, fashion, entertainment, around the experience with a specific product based on cola and romancing the idea of the cola nut as the key ingredient of the colas. Now, for timing reason, I will skip a couple of videos that I have here in relation to this specific activation. But this is a render of the cola house we are opening in the meatpacking, uh, probably towards the end of April and May. Uh, you are all invited to join us. It's going to be by the Chelsea Market. And there will be, again, it will be about experiences, uh, cocktails based on cola nut, but it will be also about experiences, the world of uh, Pepsi and how Pepsi activates creating this collision or facilitating this collision between music programming, fashion, art, and a variety of different other variables. And the idea of Cola House is something also that we are, that we transform in a modular experience that we are taking from event to event. This is, for instance, Super Bowl, and the activations are on Super Bowl uh, a few weeks ago. We are, gonna, we are gonna skip this video for timing reason, but um, essentially, if we are able, really, every time to build these three steps of interaction that everybody finds really natural because it's who we are, it's human being, we can then translate everything, you know, these three steps of interaction in specific business value. When you have the visual relation with a product or a brand, there is a high probability that you're going to create emotional input purchase. You go to a store with a list of things to buy, and you get out of the store with things that you are not planning to buy at all. Interactive is that emotional satisfaction and loyalty. Is line of people uh, out of an Apple store to buy an Apple Watch or an iPad even before they ever saw that product because that there is that emotional trust and loyalty for the brand. The expressive one is communication and spontaneous PR, is word of mouth, is people proud of your product and they are becoming your brand ambassador. You don't need to pay them. They are talking about you and your brand with pride. If you want to oversimplify, it's about purchasing, repurchasing, and recommending. This is the business world that our business friends, our marketing friends are very sensitive to. If you want to go back to the design world, to the user world, to the people world, this is about wow, this is about engagement, and this is about pride. So every time we design our products, we design our touch points of the brands, this is what we always search to create the wow effect, that emotional and rational engagement, and finally, the pride of being associated with the brand and with the product. And this needs to happen in a very consistent way, in a very seamless way, in a very authentic way, across every touch point of the brand. That's the challenge. How to do it across every touch point of the brand, and then for a company like ours, across every geography of the world, in a consistent way, but also in a local way. So in a global way, but locally relevant. Now, I want to leave you with some of the challenges and opportunities that we face when we try to create this kind of new mindset to brand building and product and, and, and brand innovation in big corporation like PepsiCo. Th this could be another one hour presentation. There are many, many challenges and opportunities. I will leave you with just one, and this is finding the right people. Processes, frameworks are not enough. It's all about the right people. This is also a paper that I wrote now in 2009, so many years ago, uh, that you can find online. But essentially, there, are a spe there is a specific profile of people that, that can be called innovators or design thinkers. And it's the profile of people we are searching. By the way, today, we also have our head of HR here. We, are adding, we have tons of positions open. Maria, can you just... Okay, she's there. If you're interested to join us, this is pure promotional advertising message. Anyway, uh, these are the characteristics of the design thinkers and innovators I want to leave you with today. The mindset of a design thinker, of innovator, and entrepreneur is, first of all, they're visionary and they're abductive. They look long-term. They understand where they want to go, and then they rebuild the path, the path 
to the vision step by step in an analyti analytical way. They are elegant in their process and their execution. Their products, their solution are in perfect balance. All the variables is like jazz, is like music. They are polyglot and storyteller. They are able to talk different kinds of languages and interact with a variety of different disciplines from finance to manufacturing, consumer insights, marketing, R&D. They are intuitive and they trust their guts. They trust their intuition. Intuition is really at the key of innovation. They are dialectical. They are very comfortable in moving from one field to the other. In corporation, often they tend to put you in a silos. Innovator entrepreneurs, by definition, they jump from one boundary to the other. And finally, they are in love. And what is the difference between customer love, loving your consumer, loving your users, and satisfying them. In corporation, often you hear this word, customer satisfaction. I remember in 3M, 2010 was the year of the customer satisfaction. Well, the difference is that when you want to satisfy somebody, you try to do everything is necessary to fulfill a specific need. But when you love somebody, when you love somebody, you try to do more. It's the magic, it's the unexpected, it's the surprise. And this is what drives real designers, entrepreneurs, innovators. You want to constantly surprise and do the magic and go beyond any expectation for the people you design for. And this is relatively easy at the beginning of the process, in the diverging phase when you explore all kinds of things. But it becomes very difficult when you face all the constraints of cost, timing, when consumer research tells you don't take the risk. And that's when you are really a real innovator, when you, go, you can go through all of these and preserve the love for people. This is what, for instance, was driving Steve Jobs. If you didn't read uh, his biography, read it because it's, it's a love story before anything else. And then from a behavior standpoint, well, they are curious. They love diversity. They listen with humility, but they don't get paralyzed by listening. At a certain point, in, with confidence, they take decision and they take action. They are resilient and resistant because every time you innovate, every time you try to change something, you will find roadblocks. If you don't, it means you are not innovating. So you need to be resilient and you need to be also optimistic because at the end of the day, it's very, very important to preserve that kind of uh, positive approach. They are always in quest, always hungry for something new. They always go the extra mile. If everybody set 100 as the target, Real innovators set targets that are higher every time for them. Very few will reach 100, but very, almost nobody will reach that target that is above the 100 that you set for yourself. They are very aware and self-conscious, and mostly they smile and have fun. At the end, this is uh, all a big game. Uh, the problems in life are others, and so it's so important to have fun in what we do every day. So if you want to take home one thing of today's presentation, design is absolutely not just not just about products or packaging or a piece of digital content, it's all about our company things. Thank you. That was amazing. I didn't want you to stop. Um, <laughs> uh, let's do a quick Q&A. So uh, I think we have time for two or three questions. Uh, any, I guess one question for me. So as a chief design officer, I'm curious, how much time do you get to spend designing today versus building an organization and running the organization? Well, my, my uh, preferred design project is actually to change, or I, I shouldn't say change, to evolve the culture of, of the company. So that's my biggest design project. Then the specific design projects are part of the bigger project. So I, I do spend time with my teams in designing as well, but I have a lot of people under me that actually do do the real work and I'm there helping and directing them. For me, the most important thing ever is to find the best, best talents in my team, you know, so that you can empower them, trust them, and let them go. And then you are there to co-create with them, but it's really about uh, having the best team. My biggest project is really evolving the culture of the company.
we, we work a lot with external entities. It's so important to open your mind, have a conversation that really help you change in perspective. So it's absolutely critical to have an internal teams because integration with the business thinking is key, else you, you really are not able to, to change cultures of organizations. But in the meantime, the collaboration, the dialogue with external entities is totally key. And by the way, answering also to your question, I spend a lot of time in these conversations. I spend a lot of time in finding partners, not just in the design community, in any kind of community that can inspire me, my team, and the company to do things that are no, nobody ever did before. when I was a junior designer. Well, I always, I've been always thinking big, and probably a lot of people for sure were, think, was, were thinking that I was extremely naive. What I was in love with was the idea of impacting the world, impacting society, do something that would really help people. Today, you know, looking back, it's easier to, to say today, I was not saying it back then, but my, my dream, my love is to create fragment of happiness through moments of pleasure, of fun, of confidence, of safety uh, in the life of people. And if we all, designers, design community and design leaders, are joined by this vision, we really have the power to change the world, to create a better world. We control the tools of creation. Even when we work with this corporation, you know, marketing businesses, they do strategy and everything. But we, if we elevate ourselves to the level of strategy, so we are part of the strategic conversation about the future of this company, brands, and products. And then on top of it, we also control the tools to create these things. And we, as design community, we are co all connected about this vision of creating a better society. We can really change the world. And that's what I, I've been in love with since I was a kid without even realizing now, today, looking back, connecting the dots, I know that that was my passion. And, and that's why I love also to work for corporations because they give me access to millions and millions of people around the world, the resources to actually work on this dream that I have. Yeah? Okay. Um, I think this was a great slide to end on, and I'm just curious, like, coming into Pepsi, which is like a company of hundreds, thousands of people, um, what some of the challenges you had in changing their mindsets? Because it's a little different than just hiring really smart, talented people when you have to actually change, you know, the minds of all these people that you inherit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not easy. That's why... Um, when I talk about the goal of my design organization, there is branding, there is innovation, there is the image and the purpose of the organization, but then there is a fourth bucket that is culture. Um, it's big, a big chunk of the work we do. It's, it's extremely difficult. It's a connection of many, many different variables. Uh, you need to have the sponsorship and the protection of the top of the company. You need to have the best, best talents in the organization. And this is not that obvious because often companies that are very, very strong in one asset, for instance, technology or branding, they are very uncomfortable in hiring people from other fields. So you need to have the courage as a company to hire the best talents without having been afraid of not being able to retain them or not giving them the right assets to, to really uh, empower them to, to impact. And then you need to create connection inside the organization with what I call the co-conspirators. Are those people, for us as designers, those people in the marketing organization, sometimes in R&D on other functions that essentially own projects and they can partner with you to create quick wins, to create success cases as fast as possible that then can become really the proof point for the organization that actually what you're doing makes sense. When you start to create value in the market, you start to really change, well, first of all, impacting top line and bottom line, so sales and profit, but then also relation with customers, uh, relation, I mean, the, uh, the way consumer look at you, um, the cycle of innovation, so you speed up the cycle of innovation, you create efficiency, you raise the quality, you impact the brands, and so on and so forth. Those are all proof points that show the organization that actually this new thing called design, or whatever is the new culture that you're introducing, is creating value. When that happens, it's like fire. It's just spread like fire. We are, right now, we are opening 11 design centers around the world. Uh, we are up to 160 people. Uh, by the summer, we'll be up to 160 people. And the vast majority of these resources have been actually funded by the businesses, by the countries. But all these human beings, these people, because they, again, it's not about process, it's people with a name and last name, they were like, 
oh, in this design thing, I see value. I want to have some of this for me, for my business. And so it's, it, 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 it's not easy. It's not easy to change the culture. But then these are companies that are really, they, they are thirsty for innovation. They want to win. They want to innovate. They want to change the world. I mean, that's the culture of company at PepsiCo. So when they understand that the new culture can create value, and it takes a while, but when they do it, then they jump on it full speed. Mauro, thank you very, very much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.